Welcome back to Monitors Unboxed. Today, I'm testing the motion performance of a few more handheld console displays and comparing those to the Nintendo Switch 2. A lot of you guys were interested in the test results from the Switch 2, but wanted to see additional results from other handhelds to get a better idea of the general handheld market. Are they all a bit slow, or do we see some products performing more like a typical gaming monitor that we mostly review on the channel? I just so happen to have a few other handhelds here at the office to put through our motion tests. I've got the Steam Deck original model. This is the one with the 7 inch 1280 by 800 IPS LCD at 60 hertz. Uh, I've got another Steam Deck. So here we are. This is the OLED model, 7.4 inch 1280 by 800 OLED at 90 hertz. Definitely a big upgrade from the original unit, which is why I bought it. I've got the ROG Ally X. So this is the most recent version of ASUS's handheld console from 2024 with its seven inch 1080p IPS LCD at 120 Hz. And lastly, I've got this guy, which is absolutely tiny in comparison. This is an original Sony PlayStation Portable. Uh, this is technology from 2004, the PSP 1000 model with a 4.3 inch 480 by 272 LCD at 60 Hertz. Uh, this is my childhood model that I happen to find in a box somewhere. It turns on, still works even on battery, so I'll be testing its display today. It's wild to think that back in the day, these sorts of handhelds came with a pop-out optical disk drive, a truly amazing use of space, but hey, that's how we used to play Grand Theft Auto Liberty City Stories back in 2005. So let's first look at the Steam Deck LCD version and its measured response time performance. Again, we're using the same methodology to measure handhelds as we do for desktop monitors, but with a reduced number of samples as this testing is done manually. What I found with the Steam Deck LCD is that it's pretty slow, around the same performance level as the Switch 1 original LCD version. With a 19.6 millisecond average response time across these 20 transitions, it's 9% faster than the Switch, which is a negligible difference. Like the Switch 1 and Switch 2, the Steam Deck LCD has the performance characteristics of a slow IPS LCD panel without any overdrive. IPS technology has gone through several generations, the latest of which is usually branded as Fast IPS, which refers to a version of IPS that even without overdrive enabled, has response time performance generationally superior to older IPS panels. Fast IPS in our testing usually achieves around a 10 millisecond average response time with overdrive disabled. The Steam Deck LCD and Switch 1 hit 20 milliseconds, which is more like what we used to see around five years ago before Fast IPS hit the market. The vast majority of new IPS LCD gaming monitors on the market use fast IPS, so Steam Deck LCD sort of performance is quite unusual to see in monitors these days, but is obviously a bit more common in the handheld display space. The ASUS ROG Ally X performs noticeably better. It also uses an IPS LCD panel, but with overdrive enabled, and this allows it to hit an 8.4 millisecond average response time even at 60 hertz, which is how I've tested all of these displays. It also has a 120 hertz configuration, and with these sorts of performance numbers, it gives a genuine clarity advantage at 120 hertz and isn't bottlenecked by response times unlike the Switch 2, which is too slow to properly support its 120Hz refresh rate. You'll also see the ROG Ally X gets the closest to a desktop IPS monitor of any of the handhelds tested so far, and while it's not quite as fast as this IPS monitor example, it has pretty good motion clarity as we'll see later in the UFO tests. Next up, let's add the Steam Deck OLED to the picture along with a desktop QD OLED gaming monitor. What surprised me a bit is there is a measurable difference in response times between the OLED panel on the Steam Deck and a typical QD OLED monitor, both tested at 60 Hz. But we're talking about 1 millisecond versus 0.3 milliseconds, which in reality gives you basically the same motion experience. The Steam Deck OLED is incredibly fast and easily gives you fast enough response times to support 60 Hz and its maximum 90 Hz mode. I would also expect this sort of performance from the OLED panel in the Switch 1 OLED model, and while I don't own a Switch OLED to test, this should be a good proxy for how that model compares to the Switch 1 LCD and Switch 2. Basically, it's not a contest. The OLED you get in the Steam Deck absolutely destroys the LCD Switch models and handily beats even the ROG Ally X. This is why it's a significant upgrade over the Steam Deck LCD model in addition to color performance and contrast. 
Lastly, I've got the PlayStation Portable in here, which has abysmal motion clarity compared to modern displays. This panel is extremely slow, offering a 62 millisecond average response time, with a couple of the darker transitions exceeding 100 milliseconds. This is very visible using the screen. You can see some transitions occurring as more of a gradient than a sharp change, and this display is simply nowhere near the performance required to support 60 or even 30 hertz. We're talking about LCD performance from 2004 here, which is clearly terrible compared to where things are at today with the best screens. This gives some important context around the Switch 2 display. Yes, the Switch 2 is very slow, but there have been handheld screens in the past that are even worse. The PSP 1000 is twice as slow, so it's not accurate to say the Switch 2 is on the level of the PSP. With that said, considering the ROG Ally X is an order of magnitude faster than the PSP, the Switch 2 coming in at 33 milliseconds isn't exactly a good result when compared against a 20-year-old device. Without a doubt, the Switch 2 uses outdated panel technology in terms of speed. Here is a comparison between these handhelds and a few other displays, so we can see how it compares to current generation monitor panel technology. I've got in here the fastest QD OLED on the market, the MSI 272 QPX50. I've got a very fast TN LCD for esports gaming, the ASUS PG248 QP. I've got the Gigabyte M27 UP, which is a typical 4K fast IPS screen. The AOC Q27G 40XMN, that represents mid-range VA panels. And I've also put in the slowest IPS LCD gaming monitor I've tested using this methodology, which uses an older generation IPS panel with no overdrive enabled. So not one of these newer fast IPS screens. As you can see, the Steam Deck LCD and Switch One LCD have similar motion performance to this last gen IPS LCD monitor. This makes total sense given none of these three products use overdrive, so we would expect similar results. The Switch 2 somehow reports in even slower than this, as we talked about in the last video, and the PSP is even worse again. Meanwhile, the Steam Deck OLED and other OLED handhelds as well are miles in front for motion clarity and the overdrive enabled ROG Ally X performs well for an LCD. Here is a UFO test comparison between four LCD based handhelds. I couldn't test the PSP in the UFO test because the browser is so old, it doesn't even support the old legacy version of the UFO test website. Anyway, this is a visual representation of the blurriness of these displays in motion, and you can clearly see how the ROG Ally X, twice as fast as the Steam Deck LCD and Switch One LCD in response time numbers, offers superior motion clarity than those other handhelds. The Ally has fewer blur trails behind the UFO, better clarity within the UFO so you can sort of make out details like the joystick and better separation between various elements. For example, the gap between the UFO and crash test markers is only visible in the Ally X result, as is the gap between the alien's green head and the side of the cockpit. The Steam Deck LCD and Switch One LCD have similar sorts of motion performance with similar levels of blur. The Steam Deck is slightly better in this test, but realistically, neither of these panels offer good clarity at 60Hz. With that said, both of these systems offer better motion handling than the Switch 2, which is still far and away the worst result with the most blur. If you try to compare the Ally X to the Switch 2, it's a very obvious difference, and this is with both devices using IPS LCD panels. So that goes to show the range in quality that an LCD can offer. I'll throw in here now the Steam Deck OLED. So this is the actual UFO test run on its OLED panel. And I'm comparing that to the Switch 2, Steam Deck LCD, and ROG Ally X. The OLED version of the Steam Deck is clearly the best handheld of this bunch. It's much faster than the ROG Ally X in our response time results, so it offers clearer visuals in this test. There is still sample and hold motion blur due to the low 60Hz refresh rate used across all of these tests, but this OLED offers the best clarity you can get at this refresh rate with much less blur than the LCDs and better definition. This illustrates the sort of downgrade that someone would experience going from a Steam Deck OLED or Switch 1 OLED to the Switch 2. It's a huge difference, and in comparison, the Switch 2 is significantly blurrier. As I talked about in the last video, this makes the Switch 2 panel much worse for fast-paced games like Mario Kart, side-scrolling platformers, and shooters. Now, I have heard a wide variety of thoughts on these results for the Switch 2, everything from Switch 2 owners saying they immediately noticed the issues to people saying they think the screen is great and have no problem with it. It seems there has been a lot of discussion and fighting in the community about which of these sides is right, with one side not believing the other side could hold such a different opinion. 
While the test data shows the screen is slow and the results relative to other displays are poor, it's still possible for both opposing opinions to be correct. What you think of various display characteristics can be highly subjective, and some people are more sensitive to issues than others. This isn't just an opinions vary thing either. Some people's brains are wired to respond to visual inputs from the eye differently than others. The most common way this presents across a group of people is with PWM flicker. Some people are not sensitive to backlight flicker at all, while others are very sensitive and viewing displays with flicker causes eye strain, headaches, or nausea. It's genuinely impossible for people not sensitive to flicker to see or feel the negative effects of flicker. With motion clarity, some people are more sensitive to blur than others and find it easier to see the issue. This can depend on how your brain is wired, but also the games you are playing, what you are looking at in those games, and how observant you are. It can also depend on the reference point you have for display motion. If you have played a ton of games on CRTs or OLEDs, which have much better motion clarity than LCDs, your reference point is set to the clarity those screens provide. Moving to a slow LCD like the Switch 2 can be an extremely noticeable backward step, while someone else that hasn't extensively used fast panels will find it much harder to notice the issue with a slow LCD. Ultimately, I think most people would be able to identify how slow the Switch 2 screen is in a side-by-side -side comparison with an OLED panel running the same content. You should see a difference in motion similar to what we are showing in the UFO test results, but if you just pick up a Switch 2 and don't perform a side-by-side -side comparison to something better, I can understand how you might not notice its slowness, and that's fine. In these situations, ignorance can be bliss, and you'll enjoy your experience with the Switch 2 more than those that are highly sensitive to motion. I wanted to address a few other commonly asked questions about these results. Firstly, why are our response time numbers different to some other people that have also tested the response times? Who is more correct? Well, testing response times is not as straightforward as testing frames per second performance as an example. With FPS output, you count the frames, everyone is on the same page really about how to do that, all good. With response times, you have to make a decision about where to measure the start and end point of the transition, which depends on the noise in your testing tools and your opinion about what best represents the visual clarity users will see. Because of this, there are multiple ways to test response times and other methods aren't necessarily incorrect. I have a video linked in the description that describes how I test response times, the decisions I've made about where I measure the start and end points, and why I test this way. Compared to some more common methodologies, my testing process is a bit more complex, but ends up capturing more of the total transition curve, which I think is a better way to do it. This means my numbers are usually higher than other people's numbers and not directly comparable. What matters most is the relative difference between products tested using the same method, not the actual raw output number. In the first video, I suggested that one possible reason for the Switch 2 not using overdrive is power consumption. I have some more information to share here thanks to someone reaching out who works on handhelds, specifically the display panel side of handhelds. According to their testing, enabling overdrive on a handheld panel increases power consumption by 100 to 200 milliwatts, depending on the type of panel and its refresh rate. So the higher voltage overdrive requires does increase power consumption, but overall it's not a significant increase. The person I spoke who said it was a negligible difference. With the Switch 2 consuming around 10 watts peak in the handheld mode, enabling a feature that only consumes 100 to 200 milliwatts would only increase power usage by 1 to 2% and reduce battery life by that amount. That's of course in peak situations, but even if we said the Switch 2 was using around 4 watts, so delivering just shy of 5 hours of battery life on its 19 watt hour battery, enabling overdrive would only reduce battery life by approximately 10 minutes. It's questionable whether Nintendo would have made this trade-off for what would amount to minutes of battery life gain. Other possible reasons for not using overdrive include a lack of hardware support in the panel controller, concerns around panel longevity and failure rates from being driven at a higher voltage, lack of meaningful gain from using overdrive, and of course, engineering laziness. I would like to think it's not that last reason and that there is some sort of genuine reason behind the decision. I was asked a lot about whether Nintendo could implement overdrive and increase panel performance via a firmware update. Now this is theoretically possible provided the panel controller supports overdrive. If panel voltage cannot be adjusted through a firmware update and is fixed for that type of panel, then no update could improve performance. On a gaming monitor, 99% of the time overdrive can be enabled or tweaked via firmware changes, but I have no idea whether it's possible on the Switch 2's hardware. Theoretically, it should be possible, but it's also possible that hardware support for overdrive isn't present due to cost cutting or other technical reasons. 
The other possibility is that adjusting overdrive is not possible via a firmware update, but is possible via a hardware revision. And I don't mean an entirely new display, which is probably preferable at this point, but with a tweak to the controller at the factory. So something to look out for is a switch to hardware revision, though honestly, I wouldn't hold my breath for Nintendo addressing the speed issue, either via a hardware revision or via a firmware revision. I think it will probably stay the same, but I guess you never know. So anyway, that's it. A few more handheld displays tested, a few of your questions answered, and hopefully that's enough of this sort of testing for now. I'll just head back over and stick to gaming monitors for the next little bit. So anyway, if you have enjoyed this content and you want to support the channel directly, we have our Patreon page. Links to that is in the description below. If you sign up, you'll get access to some pretty cool benefits. We've got our Discord chat, which is a great place to chat about displays and other PC gaming hardware. We've also got BTS videos and plenty of other good stuff. So thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.